Pale Horse by Agatha Christie Read by Hugh Fraser Foreword by Mark Easterbrook There are two methods, it seems to me, of approaching this strange business of the pale horse. In spite of the dictum of the White King, it is difficult to achieve simplicity. One cannot, that is to say, begin at the beginning, go on to the end, and then stop. For where is the beginning? To a historian, that always is the difficulty. At what point in history does one particular portion of history begin? In this case, you can begin at the moment when Father Gorman set forth from his presbytery to visit a dying woman. Or you can start before that, on a certain evening in Chelsea. Perhaps, since I am writing the greater part of this narrative myself, it is there that I should begin. Chapter 1 Mark Easterbrook's Narrative The espresso machine behind my shoulder hissed like an angry snake. The noise it made had a sinister, not to say devilish, suggestion about it. Perhaps, I reflected, most of our contemporary noises carry that implication. The intimidating, angry scream of jet planes as they flash across the sky the slow, menacing rumble of a tube train approaching through its tunnel, the heavy road transport that shakes the very foundations of your house. Even the minor domestic noises of today, beneficial in action though they may be, yet carry a kind of alert. The dishwashers, the refrigerators, the pressure cookers, the whining vacuum cleaners. Be careful, they all seem to say. I am a genie, harnessed to your service, but if your control of me fails... A dangerous world. That was it. A dangerous world. I stirred the foaming cup placed in front of me. It smelled pleasant. What else will you have? Nice banana and bacon sandwich? It seemed an odd juxtaposition to me. Bananas I connected with my childhood, or occasionally flambe with sugar and rum. Bacon, in my mind, was firmly associated with eggs. However... When in Chelsea, eat as Chelsea does. I agreed to have a nice banana and bacon sandwich. Although I lived in Chelsea, that is to say, I had had a furnished flat there for the last three months, I was in every other way a stranger in these parts. I was writing a book on certain aspects of mogul architecture, but for that purpose I could have lived in Hampstead or Bloomsbury or Streatham or Chelsea, and it would have been all the same to me. I was oblivious of my surroundings except for the tools of my trade, and the neighbourhood in which I lived was completely indifferent to me. I existed in a world of my own. On this particular evening, however, I had suffered from one of those sudden revulsions that all writers know. Mogul architecture, Mogul emperors, the Mogul way of life, and all the fascinating problems it raised became suddenly as dust and ashes. What did they matter? Why did I want to write about them? I flicked back various pages, rereading what I had written. It all seemed to me uniformly bad, poorly written and singularly devoid of interest. Whoever had said history is bunk, Henry Ford, had been absolutely right. I pushed back my manuscript with loathing, got up and looked at my watch. The time was close on 11 p.m. I tried to remember if I had had dinner. From my inner sensations I thought not. Lunch, yes, at the Athenaeum. But that was a long time ago. I went and looked into the refrigerator. There was a small remnant of desiccated tongue. I looked at it without favour. So it was that I wandered out into the King's Road and eventually turned into an espresso coffee bar with the name Luigi written in red neon light across its window and was now contemplating a bacon and banana sandwich whilst I reflected on the sinister implications of present-day noises and their atmospheric effects. All of them, I thought, had something in common with my early memories of pantomime. Davy Jones arriving from his locker in clouds of smoke, trap doors and windows that exuded the infernal powers of evil, challenging and defying a good fairy diamond or some such name, who in turn waved an inadequate-looking wand and recited hopeful platitudes as to the ultimate triumph of good in a flat voice, thus prefacing the inevitable song of the moment which never had anything to do with the story of that particular pantomime. 
it came to me suddenly that evil was, perhaps necessarily, always more impressive than good. It had to make a show. It had to startle and challenge. It was instability attacking stability. And in the end, I thought, stability will always win. Stability can survive the triteness of good fairy diamond, the flat voice, the rhymed couplet, even the irrelevant vocal statement of there's a winding road runs down the hill to the old world town I love. All very poor weapons, it would seem, and yet those weapons would inevitably prevail. The pantomime would end in the way it always ended. A staircase and the descending cast in order of seniority, with good fairy diamond practicing the Christian virtue of humility, and not seeking to be first, or in this case, last, but arriving about halfway through the procession, side by side with her late opponent, now seen to be no longer the snarling demon king breathing fire and brimstone, but just a man dressed up in red tights. The espresso hissed again in my ear. I signaled for another cup of coffee and looked around me. A sister of mine was always accusing me of not being observant, not noticing what was going on. You live in a world of your own, she would say accusingly. Now, with a feeling of conscious virtue, I took note of what was going on. It was almost impossible not to read about the coffee bars of Chelsea and their patrons every day in the newspapers. This was my chance to make my own appraisal of contemporary life. It was rather dark in the espresso, so you could not see very clearly. The clientele were almost all young people. They were, I supposed, vaguely what was called the offbeat generation. The girls looked as girls always did look to me nowadays, dirty. They also seemed to me much too warmly dressed. I had noticed that when I had gone out a few weeks ago to dine with some friends. The girl who had sat next to me had been about twenty. The restaurant was hot, but she had worn a yellow wool pullover, a black skirt, and black woolen stockings, and the perspiration poured down her face all through the meal. She smelt of perspiration-soaked wool and also strongly of unwashed hair. She was said, according to my friends, to be very attractive, not to me. My only reaction was a yearning to throw her into a hot bath, give her a cake of soap, and urge her to get on with it. Which just showed, I suppose, how out of touch with the times I was. Perhaps it came of having lived abroad so much. I recalled with pleasure... Indian women with their beautifully coiled black hair and their saris of pure bright colours hanging in graceful folds and the rhythmic sway of their bodies as they walked. I was recalled from these pleasant thoughts by a sudden accentuation of noise. Two young women at the next table had started a quarrel. The young men who were with them tried to adjust things, but without avail. Suddenly they were screaming at each other. One girl slapped the other's face. The second dragged the first from her chair. They fought each other like fishwives, screaming abuse hysterically. One was a tousled redhead, the other a lank-haired blonde. What the quarrel was about, apart from terms of abuse, I did not gather. Cries and catcalls arose from other tables. At a girl! Soccer, Lou! The proprietor behind the bar, a slim Italian-looking fellow with sideburns, whom I had taken to be Luigi, and authority, dressed in blue, stood on the threshold and uttered the regulation words majestically. "'What's going on here?' Immediately a common front was presented to the enemy. Oh, "'Just a bit of fun,' said one of the young men. "'Oh, that's all,' said Luigi. "'Just a bit of fun among friends.' With his foot he kicked the tufts of hair adroitly under the nearest table. The contestants smiled at each other in false amnesty. The policeman looked at everybody suspiciously. Oh, "'We are just going now.' said the blonde, sweetly. Come on, Doug. By a coincidence, several other people were just going. Authority watched them go grimly. His eyes said that he was overlooking it this time, but he'd got his eye on them. He withdrew slowly. The redhead's escort paid the check. You all right? said Luigi to the girl who was adjusting a headscarf. Lou served you pretty bad, tearing your hair out by the roots like that. "'I didn't hurt,' said the girl nonchalantly. She smiled at him. "'Sorry for the row, Luigi.' The party went out. 
The bar was now practically empty. I felt in my pocket for change. Oh, she's a sport, all right, said Luigi approvingly, watching the door close. He seized a floor brush and swept the tufts of red hair behind the counter. It must have been agony, I said. I'd have hollered if it had been me, admitted Luigi. But she's a real sport, Tommy is. You know her well? Oh, well, she's here most evenings. Tuckerton, that's her name. Thomasina Tuckerton, if you want the whole set out. But Tommy Tucker's what she's called round here. Stinking rich, too. Her old man left her a fortune. What does she go and do? Comes to Chelsea, lives in a slummy room halfway to Wandsworth Bridge, and mooches around with a gang all doing the same thing. Beats me. Half of that crowd's got money. Could have any mortal thing they want, stay at the Ritz if they liked. But they seem to get a kick out of living the way they do. Yeah, beats me. It wouldn't be your choice. Ah, no, I've got sense, said Luigi. As it is, I just cash in. I rose to go, and asked what the quarrel was about. Ah, Tommy's got hold of the other girl's boyfriend. He's not worth fighting about, believe me. Well, the other girl seemed to think he was, I observed. Ah, oh, Lou's very romantic, said Luigi tolerantly. It was not my idea of romance, but I did not say so. It must have been about a week later that my eye was caught by a name in the deaths column of the Times. Tuckerton. On October the 2nd, at Fallowfield Nursing Home, Amberley, Thomasina Ann, aged 20, only daughter of the late Thomas Tuckerton Esquire of Carrington Park, Amberley, Surrey. Funeral private. No flowers. No flowers for poor Tommy Tucker. And no more kicks out of life in Chelsea. I felt a sudden fleeting compassion for the Tommy Tuckers of today. Yet, after all, I reminded myself, how did I know that my view was the right one? Who was I to pronounce it a wasted life? Perhaps it was my life, my quiet, scholarly life, immersed in books, shut off from the world that was the wasted one. Life at second hand. Be honest now. Was I getting kicks out of life? A very unfamiliar idea. The truth was, of course, that I didn't want kicks. But there again, perhaps I ought to. An unfamiliar and not very welcome thought. I dismissed Tommy Tucker from my thoughts and turned to my correspondence. The principal item was a letter from my cousin Rhoda Despar, asking me to do her a favour. I grasped at this, since I was not feeling in the mood for work this morning, and it made a splendid excuse for postponing it. I went out into the King's Road hailed a taxi, and was driven to the residence of a friend of mine, a Mrs. Ariadne Oliver. Mrs. Oliver was a well-known writer of detective stories. Her maid, Millie, was an efficient dragon who guarded her mistress from the onslaughts of the outside world. I raised my eyebrows inquiringly in an unspoken question. Millie nodded, a vehement head. "'You better go right out, Mr. Mark,' she said. "'She's in a mood this morning. You may be able to help her snap out of it.' I mounted two flights of stairs, tapped lightly on a door, and walked in without waiting for encouragement. Mrs. Oliver's workroom was a good-sized room, the walls papered with exotic birds nesting in tropical foliage. Mrs. Oliver herself, in a state apparently bordering on insanity, was prowling round the room muttering to herself. She threw me a brief, uninterested glance and continued to prowl. Her eyes, unfocused, swept round the walls, glanced out of the window, and occasionally closed in what appeared to be a spasm of agony. "'Oh, but why?' demanded Mrs. Oliver of the universe. "'Why doesn't the idiot say at once that he saw the cockatoo? Why shouldn't he? He couldn't have helped seeing it, but if he does mention it, it ruins everything. There must be a way. There must be—' She groaned, ran her fingers through her short grey hair, and clutched it in a frenzied hand. Then, looking at me with suddenly focused eyes, she said, "'Hello, Mark. Oh, I'm going mad!' and resumed her complaint. "'And then there's Monica. The nicer I try to make her, the more irritating she gets. Such a stupid girl. Smug, too. Monica. Monica? I believe the name's wrong. Nancy. Would that be better? Joan? Everybody's always Joan. Anne is the same. Susan. I've had a Susan. Lucia. Lucia? Lucia. I believe I can see a Lucia.' Red-haired, polo-neck jumper, black tights, black stockings, anyway. 
This momentary gleam of good cheer was eclipsed by the memory of the cockatoo problem, and Mrs. Oliver resumed her unhappy prowling, picking up things off tables unseeingly and putting them down again somewhere else. She fitted with some care her spectacle case into a lacquered box which already contained a Chinese fan, and then gave a deep sigh and said, oh, I'm glad it's you. Well, that's very nice of you. It might have been anybody, some silly woman who wanted me to open a bazaar, or the man about Millie's insurance card, which Millie absolutely refuses to have, or the plumber, but that would be too much good fortune, wouldn't it? Or it might be someone wanting an interview, asking me all those embarrassing questions which are always the same every time. What made you first think of taking up writing? How many books have you written? How much money do you make? Etc., etc. I never know the answers to any of them, and it makes me look such a fool. Not that any of that matters, because I think I'm going mad over this cockatoo business. Something that won't gel, I said sympathetically. Perhaps I'd better go away. No, no, don't. At any rate, you're a distraction. I accepted this doubtful compliment. Do you want a cigarette? Mrs. Oliver asked with vague hospitality. Uh, there are some somewhere. Look in the typewriter lid. I've got my own, thanks. Have one. Oh, no, you don't smoke. Or drink, said Mrs. Oliver. I wish I did. It's like those American detectives that always have pints of rye conveniently in their collar drawers. It seems to solve all their problems. You know, Mark... I really can't think how anyone ever gets away with a murder in real life. It seems to me that the moment you've done a murder, the whole thing is so terribly obvious. What well, nonsense. You've done lots of them. Fifty-five at least, said Mrs. Oliver. The murder part is quite easy and simple. It's the covering up that's so difficult. I mean, why should it be anyone else but you? You stick out a mile. Well, not in the finished article, I said. Ah, but what it costs me, said Mrs. Oliver darkly. <laughs> Say what you like. It's not natural. For five or six people to be on the spot when B is murdered and all have a motive for killing B unless that is B is absolutely madly unpleasant and in that case nobody will mind whether he's been killed or not and won't care in the least who's done it I see your problem I said but if you dealt with it successfully fifty-five times you will manage to deal with it once again but that's what I tell myself said Mrs. Oliver over and over again but every single time I can't believe it and so I'm in agony she seized her hair again and tugged it violently. Don't, I cried. You'll have it out by the roots. Nonsense, said Mrs. Oliver. Hair's tough. Though when I had measles at fourteen with a very high temperature, it did come out. All round the front, most shaming. And it was six whole months before it grew properly again. Awful for a girl. Girls mind so. I thought of it yesterday when I was visiting Mary de la Fontaine in that nursing home. Her hair was coming out just like mine did. She said she'd have to get a false front when she was better. If you're sixty, it doesn't always go again, I believe. I saw a girl pull out another girl's hair by the roots the other night, I said. I was conscious of a slight note of pride in my voice, as one who has seen life. What extraordinary places have you been going to? asked Mrs. Oliver. Uh, this was in a coffee bar in Chelsea. Oh, Chelsea, said Mrs. Oliver. Everything happens there, I believe. Beatniks and Sputniks and Squares and the Beat Generation. I don't write about them much because I'm so afraid of getting the terms wrong. It's safer, I think, to stick to what you know. Or such as? Oh, people on cruises and in hotels, and what goes on in hospitals and on parish councils, and sales of work, and music festivals, and girls in shops and committees and daily women, and young men and girls who hike round the world in the interest of science, and shop assistants. She paused, out of breath. But that seems fairly comprehensive to be getting on with, I said. All the same, you might take me out to a coffee bar in Chelsea sometime, just to widen my experience, said Mrs. Oliver wistfully. Or any time you say. Tonight? Oh, not tonight. I'm too busy writing, or rather worrying because I can't write. That's really the most tiresome thing about writing, though everything is tiresome, really, except the one moment when you get what you think is going to be a wonderful idea and can hardly wait to begin. Uh, tell me, Mark, do you think it is possible to kill someone by remote control? Well, what do you mean by remote control? Press a button and set off a radioactive death ray? No, no, not science fiction. I suppose, she paused doubtfully, I really mean black magic. Wax figures and pins in them. Oh, wax figures are right out, said Mrs. Oliver scornfully, but queer things do happen in Africa or the West Indies. People are always telling you so. How natives just curl up and die, voodoo or juju or... 
Anyway, you know what I mean. I said that much of that was attributed nowadays to the power of suggestion. Word is always conveyed to the victim that his death has been decreed by the medicine man, and his subconscious does the rest. Mrs. Oliver snorted. If anyone hinted to me that I had been doomed to lie down and die, I'd take a pleasure in thwarting their expectations. I laughed. You've got centuries of good occidental sceptical blood in your veins. No predispositions. Well, then you think it can happen? I don't know enough about the subject to judge. What put it into your head? Is your new masterpiece to be murder by suggestion? No, indeed. Good old-fashioned rat poison or arsenic is good enough for me. Or the reliable blunt instrument. Not firearms, if possible. Firearms are so tricky. But you didn't come here to talk about my books. Uh, frankly, no. The fact is that my cousin Rhoda Despar has got a church fate and— Never again, said Mrs. Oliver. You know what happened last time. I arranged a murder hunt, and the first thing that happened was a real corpse. I've never quite got over it. Oh, it's not a murder hunt. All you'd have to do would be to sit in a tent and sign your own books at five bob a time. Well, said Mrs. Oliver doubtfully, that might be all right. I shouldn't have to open the fate, or say silly things, or have to wear a hat. None of these things, I assured her, would be required of her. And it would only be for an hour or two, I said coaxingly. After that, there'll be a cricket match. Oh, no, I suppose not, this time of year. Children dancing, perhaps, or a fancy dress competition. Mrs. Oliver interrupted me with a wild scream. That's it, she cried. A cricket ball, of course. He sees it from the window, rising up in the air, and it distracts him. So he never mentions the cockatoo. What a good thing you came, Mark. You've been wonderful. I don't quite see. Perhaps not, but I do, said Mrs. Oliver. It's all rather complicated, and I don't want to waste time explaining. Nice as it's been to see you, but what I'd really like you to do now is go away at once. Certainly. About the fate. I'll think about it. Don't worry me now. Now, where on earth did I put my spectacles? Oh, really, the way things just disappear. Chapter 2 Mrs. Geraghty opened the door of the presbytery in her usual sharp, pouncing style. It was less like answering a bell than a triumphant maneuver expressing the sentiment, I've caught you this time. Well, now, and what would you be wanting? she demanded belligerently. There was a boy on the doorstep, a very negligible-looking boy, a boy not easily noticeable nor easily remembered, a boy like a lot of other boys. He sniffed because he had a cold in his head. Is this the priest's place? Is it Father Gorman you're wanting? He's wanted, said the boy. Who wants him, and where, and what for? Bentall Street, twenty-three. Woman as says she's dying. Mrs. Coppin sent me. This is a Catholic place, all right, ain't it? Woman says the vicar won't do. Mrs. Geraghty reassured him on this essential point, told him to stop where he was, and retired into the presbytery. Some three minutes later, a tall, elderly priest came out carrying a small leather case in his hand. I'm Father Gorman, he said. Bentley Street? That's around by the railway yards, isn't it? That's right. Not more than a step, he ain't. They set out together, the priest walking with a free, striding step. And uh, Mrs. Coppins, did you say? Is that the name? She's the one what owns the ass. Let's room she does. It's one of the lodgers, wants you. Name it Davis, I think. Davis? I wonder now. I don't remember. She's one of you, all right. Catholic, I mean. Said as no vicar would do. The priest nodded. They came to Bentle Street in a very short time. The boy indicated a tall, dingy house in a row of other tall, dingy houses. That's it. Aren't you coming in? I don't belong. Mrs. C gave me a bob to take the message. I see. What's your name? Mike Potter. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome, said Mike, and went off whistling. The imminence of death for someone else did not affect him. The door of number 23 opened, and Mrs. Coppins, a large, red-faced woman, stood on the threshold and welcomed the visitor with enthusiasm. Coming, coming, she's bad, I'd say. Ought to be in hospital, not here. I've rung up, but goodness knows when anybody'll come nowadays. Six hours my sister's husband had to wait when he broke his leg. Disgraceful, I call it. 
Elf service, indeed. Take your money, and when you want them, where are they? She was preceding the priest up the narrow stairs as she talked. What's the matter with her? Flu's what she's had. Seemed better. Went out too soon, I'd say. Anyway, she comes in last night looking like death. Took to her bed, wouldn't eat anything, didn't want a doctor. This morning I could see she was in a raging fever. Gone to her lungs. Pneumonia. Mrs. Coppins, out of breath by now, made a noise like a steam engine, which seemed to signify assent. She flung open a door, stood aside to let Father Gorman go in, and said over his shoulder, "'Here's the Reverend for you. Now you'll be all right,' in a spuriously cheerful way, and retired. Father Gorman advanced. The room, furnished with old-fashioned Victorian furniture, was clean and neat. In the bed near the window, a woman turned her head feebly. That she was very ill, the priest saw at once. "'You come. There isn't much time,' she spoke between panting breaths. "'Wickedness. Such wickedness. I must. I must. I, I, I can't die like this. Confess. Confess my sin. Grievous. Grievous.' The eyes wandered, half-closed. A rambling monotone of words came from her lips. Father Gorman came to the bed. He spoke as he had spoken so often, so very often. Words of authority, of reassurance. The words of his calling and of his belief. Peace came into the room. The agony went out of the tortured eyes. Then, as the priest ended his ministry, the dying woman spoke again. <sighs> Stopped. It must be stopped. You will. The priest spoke with reassuring authority. I will do what is necessary. You can trust me. A doctor and an ambulance arrived simultaneously a little later. Mrs. Coppins received them with gloomy triumph. Too late, as usual, she said. She's gone. Father Gorman walked back through the gathering twilight. There would be fog tonight. It was growing denser rapidly. He paused for a moment, frowning. Such a fantastic, extraordinary story. How much of it was born of delirium and high fever? Some of it was true, of course, but how much? Anyway, it was important to make a note of certain names whilst they were fresh in his memory. The St. Francis Guild would be assembled when he got back. He turned abruptly into a small café, ordered a cup of coffee, and sat down. He felt in the pocket of his cassock. Ah, Mrs. Geraghty. He'd asked her to mend the lining. As usual, she hadn't. His notebook and a loose pencil and the few coins he carried about him had gone through to the lining. He prized up a coin or two and the pencil, but the notebook was too difficult. The coffee came, and he asked if he could have a piece of paper. This do you? It was a torn paper bag. Father Gorman nodded and took it. He began to write. The names. It was important not to forget the names. Names were the sort of thing he did forget. The cafe door opened, and three young lads in Edwardian dress came in and sat down noisily. Father Gorman finished his memorandum. He folded up the scrap of paper and was about to shove it into his pocket when he remembered the hole. He did what he had often done before, pressed the folded scrap down into his shoe. A man came in quietly and sat down in a far corner. Father Gorman took a sip or two of the weak coffee for politeness' sake, called for his bill and paid. Then he got up and went out. The man who had just come in seemed to change his mind. He looked at his watch, as though he had mistaken the time, got up and hurried out. The fog was coming on fast. Father Gorman quickened his steps. He knew his district very well. He took a shortcut by turning down the small street which ran close by the railway. He may have been conscious of steps behind him, but he thought nothing of them. Why should he? The blow from the cosh caught him completely unaware. He heeled forward and fell. 
Dr. Corrigan, whistling Father O'Flynn, walked into the DDI's room and addressed Divisional Detective Inspector Lejeune in a chatty manner. "'I've done your padre for you,' he said. "'And the result?' We'll save the technical terms for the coroner. Well and truly coshed. First blow probably killed him, but whoever it was made sure. Quite a nasty business. Yes, said Lejeune. He was a sturdy man, dark-haired and grey-eyed. He had a misleadingly quiet manner, but his gestures were sometimes surprisingly graphic and betrayed his French Huguenot ancestry. He said thoughtfully, "'Nastier than would be necessary for robbery.' "'Was it robbery?' asked the doctor. Oh, "'One supposes so.' "'His pockets were turned out, and the lining of his cassock ripped. "'Oh, they couldn't have hoped for much,' said Corrigan. "'Poor as a rat, most of these parish priests.' "'They battered his head in to make sure,' mused Lejeune. "'One would like to know why.' Two possible answers,' said Corrigan. One, it was done by a vicious-minded young thug who likes violence for violence's sake. <laughs> there are plenty of them about these days, more's the pity. And the other answer? The doctor shrugged his shoulders. Somebody had it in for Father Gorman. Was that likely? Lejeune shook his head. Most unlikely. He was a popular man, well-loved in the district. No enemies, as far as one can hear. And robbery's unlikely, unless— "'Unless what?' asked Corrigan. "'The police have a clue, am I right?' "'He did have something on him that wasn't taken away. "'It was in his shoe, as a matter of fact.' "'Corrigan whistled. "'Sounds like a spy story.' "'Lejeune smiled. "'It's much simpler than that. "'He had a hole in his pocket. "'Sergeant Pine talked to his housekeeper. "'She's a bit of a slattern, it seems. "'Didn't keep his clothes mended in the way she might have done.' She admitted that now and again Father Gorman would thrust a paper or a letter down the inside of his shoe to prevent it from going down into the lining of his cassock. And the killer didn't know that. Well, the killer never thought of that, assuming, that is, that this piece of paper is what he may have been wanting, rather than a miserly amount of small change. Or what was on the paper? Jeanne reached into a drawer and took out a flimsy piece of creased paper. "'Or just a list of names,' he said. "'Corrigan looked at it curiously. "'Ormerod. Sanford. Parkinson. "'Hesketh Dubois. Shaw. Harmonsworth. "'Tuckerton. Corrigan. Delafontaine. "'His eyebrows rose. "'I see I'm on the list. "'Do any of the names mean anything to you?' asked the inspector. "'None of them.' And you've never met Father Gorman? Never. Then you won't be able to help us much. Any ideas as to what this list means, if anything? Lejeune did not reply directly. A boy called at Father Gorman's about seven o'clock in the evening, said a woman was dying and wanted the priest. Father Gorman went with him. Oh, where to, if you know? Oh, we know. It didn't take long to check up. Twenty-three Bentall Street, house owned by a woman named Coppins. The sick woman was a Mrs. Davis. The priest got there at a quarter past seven and was with her for about half an hour. Mrs. Davis died just before the ambulance arrived to take her to hospital. I see. The next we hear of Father Gorman is at Tony's place, a small down-at-heel cafe. Quite decent, nothing criminal about it. "'Serves refreshment of poor quality and isn't much patronised. "'Father Gorman asked for a cup of coffee, "'then apparently he felt in his pocket, couldn't find what he wanted, "'and asked the proprietor, Tony, for a piece of paper. "'This,' he gestured with his finger, "'is the piece of paper. "'And then? "'When Tony brought the coffee, the priest was writing on the paper. "'Shortly afterwards he left, leaving his coffee practically untasted, "'for which I don't blame him.' "'having completed this list and shoved it into his shoe. "'Anybody else in the place? Three boys of the Teddy Boy type came in and sat at one table, "'and an elderly man came in and sat at another. "'The latter went away without ordering. "'He followed the priest. 
Or could be. Tony didn't notice when he went. Didn't notice what he looked like, either. Described him as an inconspicuous type of man. Respectable. The kind of man that looks like everybody else. Medium height, he thinks. Dark blue overcoat, or could be brown. Not very dark and not very fair. No reason he should have had anything to do with it. One just doesn't know. He hasn't come forward to say he saw the priest in Tony's place, but his early days yet. We're asking for anyone who saw Father Gorman between a quarter to eight and eight-fifteen to communicate with us. Only two people so far have responded. A woman and a chemist who had a shop nearby. I'll be going to see them presently. His body was found at eight-fifteen by two small boys in West Street. You know it? Practically an alleyway bounded by the railway on one side. The rest, you know. Corrigan nodded. He tapped the paper. "'What's your feeling about this?' "'I think it's important,' said Lejeune. "'The dying woman told him something, and he got these names down on paper as soon as he could before he forgot them. "'The only thing is, would he have done that if he'd been told under the seal of the confessional?' "'It needn't have been under a seal of secrecy,' said Lejeune. "'Suppose, for instance, these names have a connection of, say, uh, blackmail. Oh, "'That's your idea, is it?' I haven't any ideas yet. This is just a working hypothesis. Suppose these people were being blackmailed. The dying woman was either the blackmailer, or she knew about the blackmail. I'd say the general idea was repentance, confession, and a wish to make reparation as far as possible. Father Gorman assumed the responsibility. And then? Why, well, everything else is conjectural, said Lejeune. Say it was a paying racket— and someone didn't want it to stop paying. Someone knew Mrs. Davis was dying, and that she'd sent for the priest. The rest follows. I wonder now, said Corrigan, studying the paper again. Why do you think there's an interrogation mark after the last two names? Oh, it could be that Father Gorman wasn't sure he'd remembered those two names correctly. It might have been Mulligan instead of Corrigan, agreed the doctor with a grin. That's likely enough. But I'd say that with a name like De La Fontaine, either you'd remember it or you wouldn't, if you know what I mean. It's odd that there isn't a single address. He read down the list again. Parkinson. Lots of Parkinsons. Sanford. Not uncommon. Hesketh de Bois. That's a bit of a mouthful. Can't be many of them. On a sudden impulse, he leaned forward and took the telephone directory from the desk. E to L. Let's see. Hesketh, Mrs. A, John and Co. Plumbers, Sir Isidore. Ah, here we are. Hesketh de Bois, lady, 49 Ellesmere Square, SW1. What say we just ring her up? Or saying what? Oh, inspiration will come, said Dr. Corrigan airily. Go ahead, said Lejeune. What? Corrigan stared at him. I said go ahead. Lejeune spoke airily. Well, don't look so taken aback. He himself picked up the receiver. Give me an outside line. He looked at Corrigan. Number? Uh, Grosvenor 64578. Lejeune repeated it, then handed the receiver over to Corrigan. Enjoy yourself, he said. Faintly puzzled, Corrigan looked at him as he waited. The ringing tone continued for some time before anyone answered, then, interspersed with heavy breathing, a woman's voice said, Grosvenor 64578. Is that Lady Hesketh de Bois' house? Well, uh, yes, uh, I mean... Dr. Corrigan ignored these uncertainties. Can I speak to her, please? Uh, no, uh, that you can't do. Lady Hesketh de Bois died last April. Oh! Startled, Dr. Corrigan ignored the... Who is it speaking, please? And gently replaced the receiver. He looked coldly at Inspector Lejeune. So, that's why you were so ready to let me ring up. Lejeune smiled maliciously. We don't really neglect the obvious, he pointed out. Last April, said Corrigan thoughtfully. Five months ago. Five months since blackmail, or whatever it was, has failed to worry her. She didn't commit suicide or anything like that. No, she died of a tumour on the brain. So, 
Now we start again, said Corrigan, looking down at the list. Lejeune sighed. We don't really know that list had anything to do with it, he pointed out. It may have been just an ordinary coshing on a foggy night, and precious little hope of finding who did it, unless we have a piece of luck. Dr. Corrigan said, Do you mind if I continue to concentrate on this list? Go ahead. I wish you all the luck in the world, meaning I'm not likely to get anywhere if you haven't. Don't be too sure. I shall concentrate on Corrigan, Mr. or Mrs. or Miss Corrigan, with a big interrogation mark. Chapter 3 Well, really, Mr. Lejeune, I don't see what more I can tell you. I told it all before to your sergeant. I don't know who Mrs. Davis was or where she came from. She'd been with me about six months. She paid her rent regular, and she seemed a nice, quiet, respectable person. And what more you expect me to say, I'm sure I don't know. Mrs. Coppins paused for breath and looked at Lejeune with some displeasure. He gave her the gentle, melancholy smile, which he knew by experience was not without its effect. Oh, not that I wouldn't be willing to help if I could, she amended. Uh, thank you. That's what we need. Help. Women know. They feel instinctively. So much more than a man can know. It was a good gambit, and it worked. Ah, said Mrs. Coppins. I wish Coppins could hear you. So whitey, toity, and off he always was. Saying you know things, when you haven't got anything to go on, he'd say and snort. And nine times out of ten, I was right. Well, that's why I'd like to hear what ideas you have about Mrs. Davis. Was she, uh, an unhappy woman, do you think? Now, as to that, no, I wouldn't say so. Business-like, that's what she always seemed, methodical. As though she got her life planned and was acting accordingly. She had a job, I understand, with one of those consumer research associations, going round and asking people what soap powder they used, or flour, uh, and what they spend on their weekly budget, and how it's divided up. Of course, I've always felt that sort of thing is snooping, really. And why the government or anyone else wants to know beats me. All you hear at the end of it is only what everybody has known perfectly well all along. But there, there's a craze for that sort of thing nowadays. And if you've got to have it, I should say that poor Mrs. Davis would do the job very nicely. A pleasant manner, not nosy, just business-like, a matter of fact. You don't know the name of the firm or association that employed her? No, I don't, I'm afraid. Did she ever mention relatives? No. I gathered she was a widow, and had lost her husband many years ago. Bit of an invalid he'd been, but she never talked much about him. Uh, she didn't mention where she came from, uh, what part of the country. I don't think she was a Londoner. Came from somewhere up north, I should say. You didn't feel there was anything, uh, well, uh, mysterious about her? Lejeune felt a doubt as he spoke. If she was a suggestible woman, but Mrs. Coppins did not take advantage of the opportunity offered to her. Well, I can't really say that I did, certainly not from anything she ever said. The only thing that perhaps might have made me wonder was her suitcase. Good quality it was, but not new, and the initials on it had been painted over. J.D. Jesse Davis. But originally it had been J. something else. H., I think. But it might have been an A., Still, I didn't think anything of that at the time. You can often pick up a good piece of luggage second-hand, ever so cheap, and then it's natural to get the initials altered. She hadn't a lot of stuff, only the one case. Lejeune knew that. The dead woman had had curiously few personal possessions. No letters had been kept, no photographs. She had had apparently no insurance card, no bank book, no checkbook. Her clothes were of good, everyday, serviceable quality— Nearly knew. She seemed quite happy, he asked. I suppose so. He pounced on the faint, doubtful tone in her voice. You only suppose so. Well, it's not the kind of thing you think about, is it? I should say she was nicely off, with a good job, and quite satisfied with her life. She wasn't the bubbling over sort, but of course, when she got ill... Yes? When she got ill? He prompted her. Vexed she was at first. When she went down with the flu, I mean. It would have put all her schedule out, she said. Missing appointments and all that. 
But flu's flu, and you can't ignore it when it's there. So she stopped in bed and made herself tea on the gas ring and took aspirin. I said, why not have the doctor? And she said, no point in it. Nothing to do for flu, but stay in bed and keep warm, and I'd better not come near her to catch it. I did a bit of cooking for her when she got better, hot soup and toast, and a rice pudding now and again. It got her down, of course. Flu does, but not more than what's usual, I'd say. It's after the fever goes down that you get the depression. And she got that like everyone does. She sat there by the gas fire, I remember, and said to me, I wish one didn't have so much time to think. I don't like having time to think it gets me down. Lejeune continued to look deeply attentive, and Mrs. Coppins warmed to her theme. Lent us a magazines, I did. But she didn't seem able to keep her mind on reading. Said once, I remember, if things aren't all they should be, it's better not to know about it, don't you agree? And I said, that's right, dearie. And she said, I don't know. I've never really been sure. And I said, that was all right then. And she said, everything I've done has always been perfectly straightforward and above board. I've got nothing to reproach myself with. And I said, of course you haven't, dear. But I did just wonder in my own mind whether in the firm that employed her there mightn't have been some funny business with the accounts, maybe, and she got wind of it, but had felt it wasn't really her business. Possible, agreed Lejeune. Anyway, she got well again, or nearly so, and went back to work. I told her it was too soon. Give yourself another day or two, I said. And there, how right I was. Come back the second evening, she did. And I could see at once she got high fever, couldn't hardly climb the stairs. You must have the doctor, I says. But no, she wouldn't. Worse and worse she got. All that day, her eyes glassy and her cheeks like fire, and her breathing terrible. And the next day in the evening, she said to me, hardly able to get the words out, a priest. I must have a priest, and quickly, or it'll be too late. But it wasn't our vicar she wanted. It had to be a Roman Catholic priest. I never knew she was a Roman. Never had any crucifix about, or anything like that. But there had been a crucifix, tucked away at the bottom of the suitcase. Lejeune did not mention it. He sat listening. I saw young Mike in the street, and I sent him for that Father Gorman at St. Dominic's, and I rang for the doctor and the hospital on my own account, not saying nothing to her. You took the priest up to her when he came? Yes, I did, and I left them together. Did either of them say anything? Well, now, I can't exactly remember. I was talking myself, saying here was the priest, and how she'd be all right, and trying to cheer her up, but I do call to mind now, as I closed the door, that I heard her say something about wickedness. Yes, and something, too, about a horse. Horse racing, maybe? I like half a crown on myself occasionally, but there's a lot of crookedness goes on in racing, so they say. Wickedness, said Lejeune. He was struck by the word. Have to confess their sins, don't they, Romans, before they die? So I suppose that was it. Lejeune did not doubt that that was it, but his imagination was stirred by the word used. Wickedness. Something rather special in wickedness, he thought. If the priest who knew about it was followed and clubbed to death. There was nothing to be learnt from the other three lodgers in the house. Two of them, a bank clerk and an elderly man who worked in a shoe shop, had been there for some years. The third was a girl of twenty-two, who had come there recently, and had a job in a nearby department store. All three of them barely knew Mrs. Davis by sight. The woman who had reported having seen Father Gorman in the street that evening had no useful information to give. She was a Catholic who attended St. Dominic's, and she knew Father Gorman by sight. She had seen him turn out of Bentall Street and go into Tony's place about ten minutes to eight. That was all. Mr. Osborne, the proprietor of the chemist's shop on the corner of Barton Street, had a better contribution to make. He was a small, middle-aged man with a bald, domed head, a round, ingenuous face and glasses. A good evening, Chief Inspector. Come behind, will you? He held up the flap of an old-fashioned counter. Lejeune passed behind and through a dispensing alcove, where a young man in a white overall was making up bottles of medicine with the swiftness of a professional conjurer, and so through an archway into a tiny room with a couple of easy chairs, a table, and a desk. Mr. Osborne pulled the curtain of the archway behind him in a secretive manner and sat down in one chair, motioning to Lejeune to take the other. He leaned forward, his eyes glinting in pleasurable excitement. 
It just happens that I may be able to assist you. It wasn't a, a busy evening, uh, nothing much to do, the weather being unfavourable. My young lady was behind the counter. We keep open until eight on Thursdays always. The fog was coming on and there weren't many people about. I'd gone to the door to look at the weather, thinking to myself that the fog was coming up fast. The weather forecast had said it would. I stood there for a bit, nothing going on inside that my young lady couldn't deal with, face creams and bath salts and all that. Then I saw Father Gorman coming along on the other side of the street. I know him quite well by sight, of course. A shocking thing, this murder, attacking a man so well thought of as he is. There's Father Gorman, I said to myself. He was going in the direction of West Street. It's the next turn, on the left before the railway, as you know. A little way behind him there was another man. It wouldn't have entered my head to notice or think anything of that, but quite suddenly this second man came to a stop, quite abruptly, just when he was level with my door. I wondered why he'd stopped. And then I noticed that Father Gorman, a little way ahead, was slowing down. He didn't quite stop. It was as though he was thinking of something so hard that he almost forgot he was walking. And then he started on again, and this other man started to walk too, rather fast. I thought, inasmuch as I thought at all, that perhaps it was someone who knew Father Gorman and wanted to catch him up and speak to him. But in actual fact he could simply have been following him. Oh, that's what I'm sure he was doing now. Not that I thought anything of it at the time. What with the fog coming up, uh, I lost sight of both of them almost at once. 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 Almost at once.